Oh, good morning, everyone. Um, you are here, and if you're here, you're going to be hearing the dr intermediate Drupal front end development talk. Hopefully, that's what you're here for. Um, let's see. So, my name is Ashraf, it's like the A's are U's. Um, I've been running Debug Academy for a little over 10 years now. Um, I also worked as a technical architect at Acquia for a few years, and um, I have all the little fancy badges from Acquia, those Acquia certifications for Drupal 7, 8, 9, and 10. Um, if you are interested in becoming a, an Acquia certified developer, um, I'm a good person to talk to. We have certification prep courses, front end, back end, um, and we also have other um, courses. All of our courses are live. Um, the vast majority of them are hands-on. So if someone's interested in becoming a Drupal developer, maybe career change, or if you're a software developer uh, or a web developer uh, specializing in something other than Drupal, we have our Become a Drupal Developer course. It's part-time over three months, um, two three-hour classes per week for three months. Um, and that's a great one to get a lot of hands-on experience building a real project. Um, and then we have those two cert prep courses. Um, those are just four classes with a lot of uh, you know, take-home study material, uh, in-class quizzes, and then a practice exam at the end of it. Um, you should come out of those courses very well prepared for the Acquia certification exams. And finally, the Drupal Architect series. If you've been doing Drupal for a while, maybe you've built a few sites, and um, that, that course is, a, is five three-hour classes where we do a lot of deep dives on case studies. We talk about uh, optimizing performance, maintainable code, automated testing, and more, um, and building your site in a way where you won't have regrets months later, which can often be the case. Um, so we'll talk about you know, how we did the White House petitions um, migration of 30 million records, how we optimized performance on various websites and made it snappy and fought the caching demons and more. Now for today, we are um, going to be talking about intermediate front-end development in Drupal. Uh, that covers some of these topics here. Um, and we're also going to focus on a number of gotchas and you know, things that you, maybe you've encountered but uh, maybe didn't fully understand. So hopefully, hopefully everybody will come out of this um, at least learning a few new things. Uh, so we'll start with the arrays of doom. Um, Drupal is well known for these arrays of doom. At least people who are in the Drupal community tend to be familiar with them. Um, so render arrays are arrays, PHP arrays that contain the data that should be displayed as well as information on how they should be displayed. So for example, if you were displaying a um, text field, uh, the data that should be displayed might include what should the default value be for the text field, should the text field be required, and so on. Um, and then how it should be displayed is essentially enough information to tell Drupal which twig file should I get the HTML code from so I can put those two together and ultimately display a text field containing all the information that I need. In Drupal, render arrays are everywhere. Um, you can actually go really far in your career uh, while mostly avoiding interacting with them too much, um, but they are there. And um, having uh, an understanding of them is helpful for various scenarios and can make maintenance and you know, reusability of your code um, better if you can be comfortable with render arrays. Okay, so render arrays tend to look something like this. You have properties, which tend to, stand, to start with a pound sign, and organizing entries, which do not start with a pound sign. Again, these are just PHP arrays. The items that do start with pound signs, um, those are special keywords that Drupal is looking for. So you can't just add a key that starts with a pound sign and make up a name for it. Um, if it starts with a pound sign, it means that Drupal has some use for it or ha that has some meaning. Um, if it does not start with a pound sign, if it's an organizing entry in the array, um, it may just be there for legibility for the developer to understand what is in there. Um, there are exceptions to that, but generally speaking, that's the case. Here's an example of a render element. Um, you're, 
one of the areas that it might be harder to avoid interacting with render arrays is if you're creating a custom form programmatically. Um, this is what form code often looks like. Um, so we have a form array with a title property and um, you can see a render element as, as it's called. Um, in this one we have type text field. So I mentioned um, if it has a pound sign it is a special word, a special keyword that Drupal's looking for. So pound sign type. This is essentially going to map it to the appropriate twig file um, one way or another. Um, but this gives Drupal the information it needs um, for Drupal to ultimately load the right twig file. Now all of these properties, the rest of them, um, these ones are essentially become applicable properties as soon as you select the text field as the type. So text fields can have a title, and that's because um, if you have a text field, typically it has a label, right? You don't usually just see form fields without a label. Um, so if you want to set the label, you would set it in the title property. If you want to put a default value in your text field, you would put it in the default value property. If you want to set the text field width, that would be size. If you want to limit the number of characters they can type, max length, and so on. So each of these has a special meaning, and they map to something in the twig file. Now, at a higher level, the, the most common render properties you're going to see are type, and th those tend to be the types that come with Drupal core, text field, text area, color selector, color box, whatever it may be, um, and there's a lot of them. Um, there's markup if you want to put raw HTML. Um, I'd say that's level one of render arrays. Sometimes when people first run into a render array and have to return something, they might just put markup and they might return HTML. Um, plain text allows you to um, essentially um, pass text and display it as raw text. So if you were to put HTML under plain text, it would end up outputting the HTML as text, not really as HTML. And I'll show you what I mean by that on the next slide. And theme, the theme key is a special one where we can create our own render elements um, and modules can as well. Um, so that's one where when you get deeper in the weeds with render arrays, you might end up interacting with the theme key a bit more. So here are three examples. Markup, again, lets you put HTML in a render array directly. And that ends up rendering. So here we have the word hello with P tags for paragraph. And that ends up rendering as regular old HTML would render. So you see the word hello, it has paragraph tags around it that you do not see or the end user does not see. Plain text, if you put the same thing in plain text, it will not treat the HTML as HTML. It will escape the characters and display it as plain text. That would be useful for something like if someone leaves a comment um, on, a, on your article and you want to programmatically print out their comment, um, you could potentially use plain text to ensure that they don't inject HTML and run the HTML on your site. Okay. Let me switch to do not disturb mode. <laughs> okay, and then finally there are various um, elements hidden under the type, like we saw on the previous slide, text area or text field. Now, when I showed you text field, I listed all of these properties that could be set, such as title, uh, default value, and more. Um, how do you know those? By looking at the documentation, as exciting as that is. So here's the link to the render arrays that come with Drupal core. I'll click that, and you can see in Drupal 10.3, we get a list of all these render elements and you'll notice that some of them are categorized as render element and others are categorized as form element. These are all, you know, essentially render elements, but some of them are usable on forms um, or some of them are um, form inputs and the like. So if you're building a form and you're looking for form fields, you can filter this out to form element, and you'll see all of those options. Um, if you wanted to see what inputs any one of these take, you can click into it, and they show you an example um, with the inputs that tend to be used with this element. Um, some of them will have more in-depth examples as well. 
Okay. Now, how many people here um, already knew most of what I just said in terms of, you know, familiar with render arrays, just to get a read of the room? Okay. About half? Okay. Okay, good. Um, okay. So, um, the render elements, the render arrays, tend to just keep stacking up on top of each other and um, end up, uh, the entire page basically is a render array. And if you were to put a breakpoint in your code and basically pause the code mid-execution before the page displays and look at the render array um, at the last possible moment, it would look like this, what you see on the left. Um, you can see there's a page item, page top, page bottom, um, and if you were to dig into each one of these, these, you would just continue to find render elements and its render arrays all the way down. Um, it can go all the way down to a button. Every layer of it can have attached CSS, JavaScript. They can have caching information and more. So there's the render information that you're privy to, the elements you create, but there's also a lot more, again, like CSS and JavaScript that can be attached via the attached property and caching information that can be attached via the cache property. Okay, and we're going to come back to that in just a moment. Now, this, this talk, again, intermediate Drupal development, we're, we're going to touch upon various areas of Drupal theming and areas that tend to cause confusion or result in introducing bugs. Um, the next few slides are something that I hope will make theming easier for you. Um, so in Drupal, we create our content types, our block types, our media types, right? All of these various entity types. And um, at the end of the day, we want to style them. Now there's different ways to do that. Um, you can just write CSS and use the HTML that Drupal gives you. Um, you can work with the manage display to arrange the fields in a, whatever order you like. You can download add-on add modules um, such as fields group if you want to group fields and uh, you know uh, alter their output in that way. But sometimes what you really want to do is to write your own custom HTML for your content type. You want to take this field, put it on the left, take that field, put it on the right, group these two fields together in a div, and put another div around them, and etc. You basically want full HTML control, and you want to put the fields wherever you want. Um, especially if it's something like a teaser. Now, to, um, to control this, um, first of all, you have the manage display page on your content types. Now, if you go to a content type and you press manage display, initially it'll have the default display open. The default display, like the name implies, is what will be used by default. Um, you can add additional displays as well. You can create a teaser display, you can create the full page display, and more. Um, but with any of these displays, so let's just focus on the default for now. So with the default display, um, the fields, they might all be visible initially. So first of all, you can take whichever fields you don't want to display and move them down to the hidden section. But also importantly, you can configure each field's display. So you can um, go to, for example, an image field, and you can choose. Do I want this to display as the original image, as in the full size? Do I want to crop it and apply an image style? Or do I want to output it as the URL to the image? Because sometimes that's what you need for whatever reason. You might, have some, you might want to apply it as the background to a div in your HTML. You might want to write style background equals the following path. So sometimes you want the image to actually just display as a URL. So you handle what the fields should look like or what they should output through manage display. So how do you go from there to full control of the HTML? Well, any display mode that you use and any entity type, again, node for content types, media for media types, blocks, you know, comments, etc., any of these entity types, they all have twig files which you can overwrite. So node.html.twig is the twig file for all content types. That's the default twig file used for all content types. Node-teaser would be the file name to overwrite the display um, named teaser. 
So for example, if you went to your article content type and you added a display name <laughs> teaser in addition to the default one, and you wanted to overwrite its HTML, all you'd have to do once you create that display, all you'd have to do is create a file named node-teaser.html.twig. And in that file, you can customize the HTML for the teaser. Now, the, the focus here is what we were doing on the previous slide or what we were talking about, um, all of that information on the Manage Display tab, where does it go? It actually goes to the content variable in those Twig files. So if I have an article content type and it has a body field and an image field and a tags field, and I go to Manage Display and I hide the tag field and I set the image field to display a URL and I leave the body field as the default. The content variable in the twig file is actually what I just affected. That's what I changed. That content variable now no longer has the tags field because I moved it to hidden. It now has the body field however it normally had it and it has the image field as a URL. So normally these twig files just print out the content variable and that prints everything. But you can do content dot the field's machine name. So content dot body or content dot field underscore image and so on to specifically output the HTML for one field. So if you had said the image should display as a URL, you could now do content dot field underscore image and it would output the image URL. And so you can write your own HTML however you like. You can write um, ahref equals quotation marks content.field image, and it'll put the image URL right there. So that's how you get full control over the HTML. Write all the HTML you want, print out field by field wherever you like. But in that example I just gave, if I did content.field name and output the image, it would actually not only display the image URL, it would display a div around the URL, because that's just how these fields work. They all have wrapper HTML. All right, so it's going to actually give you div class equals field image, for example, and the URL inside of it, and a closing div tag. Now that doesn't work for the use case I just described. If I'm writing ahref equals, and then I'm printing out content.field image, I don't want the URL to print out as div class equals field image. I just want the URL. So if that's what you want, all you have to do is add dot zero to the end of the machine name or after the machine name. And that will strip out the wrapper and just print out the raw value. So if you want to do ahref equals content dot field image dot zero, then you actually get the raw image URL and you get what you wanted to get. So that applies to pretty much all the fields. It um, gives you, uh, I guess, except for multi-value fields, the first value would be dot zero, the second would be dot one, and so on. But for single value fields, um, if you ever want to print them without the wrapping markup, you can do that just like you see at the bottom of this slide. Content dot field heading dot zero inside of an H2. Now we're just printing out the text without an unnecessary div around it. Okay. And of course, underneath it, we do content.body, and we um, print that with the markup around it. Maybe we want the div for that field. All right. Now, okay, yes. Um, now, within Twig files, one of the issues people run into is not knowing what variables there are. And it's not as as uh, difficult as um, setting up xdebug and using a proper debugger, um, you actually can um, use the dump function. So in Twig, first of all, you would have to turn on Twig debug mode. So you can, in Drupal 10.2 and above, you can go to configuration, development, development settings, and you can enable Twig debug mode. And that gives you access to this Twig function named dump. And this line at the very bottom here, pre, this is, a, this is a regular HTML tag, pre, it stands for pre-formatted. It basically means do not strip out the spaces, don't strip out the new lines. You know, if any, anything that is there, keep it as is. Because normally in HTML, 
we indent our HTML and the indentations get ignored from the output, right? So if you don't want them to be ignored, you use the pre-tag. Okay, so we use the pre-tags and then we dump whatever variable you like. Now, it's not always a good idea to just dump the raw variable because sometimes these are objects with, with a lot of references. They're basically very big objects. And so it might not load properly, it might crash. Um, so there's a filter that Twig comes with, keys. So you can put your variable, whatever it is, and you can put this filter, so the pipe, and then the word keys. So in this example at the very bottom, the only word you would replace is my var, and you would replace that with the variable you're looking to learn more about. And what you'll get from this is um, a list of all of the properties on that object. So if this is the content variable, you'll get a list of all the machine names that are currently available, right? Not all the machine names on your content type. It's all the machine names that are configured on managed display. Because as soon as you move something to hidden on managed display, that takes it away from the content variable. So if you wanted to verify what I'm saying or test it out, you could always try this out, play with the managed display page, dump out the content variables keys and see how these properties are getting added and removed from that content variable as you configure them on the manage display page. Now this is good if you know what variable you're interested in. But if you don't even know what the variable is, um, normally Drupal's twig files have comments at the top that say, these are all the variables available in this twig file. But you know, comments can get outdated. Sometimes comments you know, are not available for any um, a myriad of reasons. Um, so twig actually comes with this magical variable named underscore context. And underscore context basically is a variable that points to all of the other variables in this twig file. So if you want to get a list, an up-to-date list that doesn't rely on comments, if you want to get an up-to-date list of all of the variables available in this twig file, all you have to do is put this line exactly as it's written and this will dump out that context variables keys. And the keys are all of the other variables available in this twig file. Okay. So now you know how to get all the variables for any twig file. Now, one of the most common issues I run into or I see when I'm, you know, I do like security audits and consulting and whatnot. And um, one of the most common issues I see is caching information is not working, the contextual links are missing on random blocks, I put a block on the layout builder, I can't edit it after I put it, you know, the miscellaneous additional, in, you know, uh, features and information are not working as expected. And that's because Drupal core and modules, they insert um, additional HTML attributes, classes, and so on um, in, these, in, in various templates. So in your node file, you'll see, um, you'll see that it has this attributes variable and it has title prefix and title suffix. And you'll see that Drupal cores themes have that and all of the um, you know, well-maintained contrib themes will also have that. Um, so when you overwrite node.html.twig or any of these entity files, you need to make sure that you do not remove any of those variables. Okay, people sometimes will just start from scratch and they'll think, you know, I want clean markup, I want to write exactly what I want to write and nothing extra. And they'll just write div class equals so and so and then print out the fields they want and call it a day. Um, and they don't realize they've just broken the caching for that component. They've, um, you know, they've broken the quick edit links if that module is enabled. They've, you know, broken the layout builder's drag and drop ability. And that's because all of that, all those things I was listing come from or are inserted via this attributes variable. So you can replace all the HTML. You can put your own div wrapper, but make sure that you still use the attributes variable that came with the twig file. Uh, make sure you also put in title prefix and title suffix, even if you don't have a title. Um, because these are the variables, again, which will 
inject things like the contextual links and the quick edit functionality and more. So specifically, make sure you retain attributes, title prefix, title suffix, and make sure you render the content variable. Now, saying render the content variable, right after I, I said you can render content.fieldImage, you can render content.body. I'm saying even if you render content.body, content.fieldImage, and all the fields you want, you still also have to render content. So why? You have to render content because um, there are additional properties. So this is coming back to what I mentioned earlier. Remember when I showed you the render array on the page and I said it has attached libraries, it has caching information, it has more that you might not be privy to. Um, and, you know, not due to a lack of knowledge, but just these are things that we don't necessarily touch. Um, those things will sometimes belong to the content variable. And if you print out the fields individually, but you don't render content, then you are essentially not rendering the content's cache information. And you are not rendering the content's attached libraries, if any. So if you already rendered the body field and field image, then you should still render the rest of the content variable. And you can do that like you see here, content, and you can use the without filter. So I want to render content without the body field or the field image field. Okay, so that way you get the best of both worlds. You can render the fields on your own terms, and then you can render the rest of the content variable just to make sure you get the CSS, JavaScript, caching, and whatever else it might come with. Now, sometimes people don't want to do that without approach because maybe their content type has 30 fields and they don't want to put a list of without 30 items. Um, so this here, I don't, I don't know whether to describe it as a hack. You know, I don't, I don't think it's really in the documentation, but it is in a Drupal core issue as one of the ways around this problem. Um, you can create a variable, call it whatever you like, and you can take the content uh, variable and, and put it through the render filter. So this is a way to basically take the output from the content you know, variable, including the field image, the body, everything, and to just put it in a variable that you ultimately don't use. Um, but the important part, let's see, the important part is that you're putting the content variable through the render function, because then the CSS and JavaScript and cache information will you know, be activated. The CSS will load, the caching information will bubble, as they say, and it'll all be used. Um, and you're, you can store it in a variable to prevent it from displaying. So as opposed to printing it, you can just store the field output in a variable. Okay. It feels like I'm moving a little quickly. I feel that as well, just trying to stick within the time. <laughs> um, but hopefully we get a good amount of information per minute. <laughs> so we're going to talk a little bit about inheritance in Twig. So Drupal has blocks. This has nothing to do with Drupal's blocks, okay? Just coincidence that they're both called blocks. So in Twig, there are, there's something called Twig blocks. And I like to think of it as just giving a name to a section of the code. So here you see block logo, and then it has this image tag. Underneath that you see block menu, and it has this menu HTML. And there's additional HTML above and below. So we are basically naming two sections of our code. So why would you name it, right? First of all, naming it has no effect to this file, right? It doesn't impact the display, no effect to this file. So why would you name it? Well, Twig supports inheritance of code. You can um, create a node.html.twig file and then you can go create a different file, call it whatever you like, um, node teaser, um, and then and your node teaser can embed or inherit the code from node.html.twig. So you can write embed from this theme, I want to embed node.html.twig. And it basically copies all the code from that file and pastes it right here. 
Now, that's fine, right? You get exactly what node.html.twig had. But sometimes you want most of what node.html.twig had, but you want to alter one line, right? You want to alter part of it. Now, what if you wanted to alter the logo, for example? Let me actually, or let's say the menu, because that's what the next slide does. Um, so on the previous slide, we had the logo section of the file was named, and the menu section of the file was also named. Now, here we're inheriting the code from that file, and now we want to inherit the code from a file, but this time we want to overwrite only the portion named menu. Okay, so you use embed as usual. You write embed, you write the file whose code you want to copy or inherit. But then in between the opening embed and the closing embed tags, you redefine or overwrite that named block. So all you have to do is define a twig block using the same name that was used in the original file. What ends up happening is all of the code gets inherited from the original file, except the portion that, the block that you named menu will take precedence over the block that they named menu. So it's a way for you to surgically insert one piece of code, inherit all the code except for that one bit. This can be done with embed. Um, there's also an alternative to embed is include. So if you just want to inherit code from another file and you don't want to swap out any of the twig blocks, you can use include. Notice there's no opening and closing with include. It's just there because there's nowhere to insert those twig blocks. Now, extends is the third option for code inheritance in Twig. Um, you can extend all the code from a file just like you can with embed. It is not intentional that we have one quote. There should be two. Um, <clears throat> but uh, so what's the difference between extends and embed? Um, Extend, well, embed can be placed anywhere within the file, right? You can have some HTML followed by an embed followed by more HTML. Extends cannot. Extends um, cannot have code above it or below it. Extends allows you to inherit code from another file and it enables you to overwrite named blocks from that file and that's it. You're not allowed to write anything above or below. You're not allowed to do anything except for inherit code and swap out the named twig blocks. So the normal, the question I normally get when I give people a chance to ask questions is why would you use this instead of embed if embed can do the same thing? Um, well, um, extends sort of communicates that the files should stay in sync in terms of structure. So Drupal, uh, Drupal core uses extend. It, um, it has a block.html.twig and then some of the you know, block system branding blocks, for example, will extend from block.html.twig. And by using extend instead of embed, you're sort of ensuring that um, whoever's maintaining the system branding block doesn't, you know, go wild and start adding things above and below the blocks wrapper. Um, it, it forces them to stick to the same structure. Um, all right. It's kind of like defining the parent, like, yeah, it's like object, if you're familiar with object-oriented programming, it's sort of like an interface, um, you know, defining a block or a twig file with a bunch of twig blocks, it's sort of like that's your interface and those are the functions that need to be defined and now when you go extend it in a different file, you can overwrite only those pieces. So it restricts how much you can do to ensure consistency. Okay. Now. Don't get too excited. We're not talking about decoupling with JavaScript. Um, but uh, when I teach theming in Drupal, one of the big issues is that there's so many things to learn before you can really do a full theming task. Or you need to typically know uh, SAS. Um, you need to learn Twig. You need to learn hooks in Drupal, pre-process hooks a little bit. Um, and you need to learn how to extract those field values like we were talking about without breaking things, etc. So one of the ways to empower people to work earlier is to separate it out. Um, you can have a styling task where people work just on the HTML and the SAS. You can have a theming task where people handle passing in the real Drupal field values. And then the backend task would be creating the content type and the like. 
So how do you do this? One way, this is what I do in my three-month course, one way is um, Drupal automatically looks for twig files by file name. So if you're just trying to create a file and your only purpose is to allow people to write HTML and SAS and you know, get through that work, you should deliberately create a twig file that Drupal will not, or that will not conflict with any of the names that Drupal is looking for. So instead of creating node.html.twig, you can create a file name like underscore teaser. So by prefixing with an underscore, you're not going to clash with any of the file names that Drupal uses. So um, you can basically say, okay, um, sorry, let me just, yes. yeah, and the, the idea here is you create files Drupal is not looking for, you work on and complete all of the styling within that file and you preview it, and then later you use embed or include, you know, those functions we were talking about to put it into the file that Drupal is looking for. So to take that code and put it into node.html.twig, and at that point you map the values content.fieldImage, you pass them into the file. So that way you can have maybe your junior developers or even your senior developers who haven't worked with Drupal that much, um, you can have them get right to writing all the HTML, writing all the Twig and SAS, and testing it on the website with dummy values. And when it's ready, then you can say, okay, now we're gonna go and embed these into the right places and map the fields. So when it comes time to embed that teaser file in your node file, you can do something like this. Embed it with, so this embed include, they, they support passing in variables to the file that you're inheriting. So you can say embed the teaser file with the following properties. For the title variable in the teaser file, I want you to pass in these words. For the long text variable in the teaser file, I want you to pass in the body field without the wrapper, content.body.0. Okay. Typically when you use this type of approach, you, you end up gravitating towards a component design um, or at least component type of, of approach where you're creating a folder per component, you're creating a twig file and a SAS file per component. Um, and with that, if you're creating a SAS file per component, then you'll likely need to import that SAS file in your um, top level SAS file to make sure it gets included when you compile all of your SAS. Okay. Now, as of Drupal 10.1, Drupal Core added a module which can be used to facilitate that approach um, that I was just describing. So I've been doing that approach for years in my three-month course, and um, in Drupal 10.1, they added the single directory components module. Um, so th this one, it's basically the same as that approach. The only difference is um, you first would have to enable the single directory components module. Again, this is only available since Drupal 10.1. Um, and then instead of putting your twig files inside of the templates folder with an underscore in the name so Drupal doesn't find them, you can just create a folder named components in your theme and you can put them in there. So components slash teaser, components slash whatever name you'd like to give to your component. They do require a YAML file to describe the, the component that you're creating. Um, it'll describe what variables it accepts. Um, it'll describe what twig blocks it has, if any. Um, and um, it auto loads the CSS. So you can have a CSS file and a JavaScript file per component and you don't have to do that import statement with your SAS. It will just automatically load the CSS file for you. If you, take all, if you take that approach, the only real difference is when you're embedding it or including it, instead of writing at theme name slash path to component, you would actually just write include theme name colon component name. So if, it's, if your theme is, you know, stylish, if that's the name, and the component name is accordion, you would say include stylish colon accordion. And then it would load that component from the folder in your theme, components slash accordion. So it'll load that twig file and it'll load the CSS and JavaScript files in that folder um, when applicable. Okay. 
about five minutes. Yep. Thank you. Okay. Now, just about done. Let's see here. Okay. So, if you want to do deeper debugging with your Twig, um, you can enable the module or download the module Twig X Debug or the Devel modules, and they uh, provide you with the ability to add what are called breakpoints. Um, so, if you're familiar with debugging in PHP, you can use tools like xdebug to put a breakpoint and pause your code mid-execution so you can look at the variables and explore. Um, so you can use the Twig xdebug module to add that functionality to Twig. Okay. Now, let's see. And last thing, it, for in terms of security with Twig, um, <coughs> We often see the T function used or the T filter used, um, like we see it here, um, down here, the word home and then the T filter. So this makes your code translatable. Um, generally speaking, you should not put variables through the T filter um, just in case uh, people use that as a way to translate their way into a, some sort of vulnerability. Um, so you should only use the T filter if you're putting in known values or known text. Um, and if you want to translate something with a variable, there are placeholders and other approaches you can use to sanitize those variables um, so that they are not part of the translation. Okay, lots of information. I'm very, I'd be very receptive or, you know, happy to hear feedback. Um, but if you're interested in, you know, training where we go through this at a more digestible pace with hands-on exercises and whatnot, um, debugacademy.com is the website. Um, we have you know, business cards up here. You can come say hello. Um, and I hope that this was beneficial. I hope you learned something new. And again, I would love to hear feedback afterwards. Um, and if you have qu questions, you know, let me know at this point. Um, I'd be happy to hear or take questions as well. Yes? <laughs> After the applause. <laughs> Thank you, thank you. Yes, you had a question? Yeah, I have one question about the single view of Twig. So yes. You do, so you put everything in and your, your SCS is called as well. How do you tell people to process it? Is it done automatically, or do you have to, like, mm -hmm. So the question. Yeah. Yes, so the question was about single directory components. Um, if you you were asking about SAS in yes. yeah so if you use SAS in a single directory component, how do you get that to be processed? Um, essentially, you have two choices. Um, either you can roll your SAS up into your main site SAS and not benefit from the the CSS auto loading within single directory components. So you can load that import your SAS file in your global SAS file and just have it loaded globally, um, or you can, I guess, three choices. You could not use SAS um, and just do CSS for the components. Um, or if you insist on using SAS and you don't want to load it globally, you'll have to just compile the SAS per component, you know, without rolling it up into any other process. Drupal Core does not support SAS at all, actually, so it doesn't have any built-in support for this. I'm sure that you know eventually we'll we'll find some trash commands or you know maybe we create our own custom commands for looping through the directories and compiling SAS in each folder, but I guess the short answer is single directory components doesn't have direct support for SAS. Yes? Do you mind going back to the, um, the T filter on bars? Yes. Yes. Um, do you have a specific question or you just like me to explain it? The, the, the top half, so... Mm -hmm. Why not to do this? What's wrong with that? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. How, how, how will I explain it to someone who's already using that? Right. So, um, so the question is, what's wrong with the top half of this? So this, first of all, is a, is a snapshot from the documentation, in case people are wondering if this is my opinion or not. Um, this is from the documentation. But the, what's wrong with it is, if you don't know what's being translated, then in theory, um, people could so assuming this is like a comment that's being translated or it's user supplied content that's being translated, um, one of the attack vectors can be that people write specific characters knowing that the translated 
results or the translated output results in HTML, in some specific HTML tag, for example. Um, there are other mitigating factors here, but that's the idea. The idea is you don't know what people are, if you don't know what people are putting into the variable, people might deliberately put something in hopes that the English characters translated to whatever other language may be in use will result in some you know, specific HTML or result in some specific attack. Um, okay. I don't have a you know, so practical I example, but that's the idea. And, and a, a better policy would be to pre-process your variable before twig anyway. A better, a better um, process would be there's a placeholder um, filter and there's a, there's a trans um, sort of like looks like a twig block. Um, so you can put your code inside of that trans twig block and you can, um, you can basically say that this variable should not be translated but the text around it should. Um, so that's the idea. Mm -hmm. Any other questions from anyone? Okay. All right, yeah, I'm around. Feel free to come by, say hello. Again, I'd love feedback on the course as I refine it before DrupalCon. All right, thank you all.